Good morning, everyone. God is good. All the time. We're welcome here at First Christian Church. As always, we're here because Jesus is alive. He's here and we're going to worship Him. Amen? i tell you what, if that song by Connie didn't get you blood stirring or something wrong with you. Thank you, Connie. We were tapping our toes over there, by the way. Hey, we want to welcome you. If you're a visitor, please take a card in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and let us know who you are. We're glad you're here. If anyone has a prayer request, please do the same. And uh, if you're watching online or Facebook, welcome to you also. Hope you can come and join us in person. There's a lot of good people here that uh, we'd love you to meet. So a lot of things in our bulletin. I know the women are meeting tomorrow at 1 o'clock. They're women of the Bible study. So that will be tomorrow at 1 here, and they're studying Rebecca. So, women, if you want to come to that, that's, that's a good study. I encourage you to do so. Also, uh, I'll give you a report on Nancy Dobbs. A lot of you calling her and think she's still at JMH, but they'll probably be moving her any day now to uh, go to a rehab center. So, please keep Nancy and Ron in your prayers, okay? And also, I have a card here from Jean and Norman. Of course, they lost their sister this week and had the funeral yesterday. And our prayers are with you. <laughs> But here's what the card says this is to the entire church. Thank you so much for all of the love, support, and prayers. We appreciate all of the food and cards that were brought to us. We love you all very, very much, Gene and Norman. We love you too. That's what church is all about, isn't it? Watching over each other, take care of each other. So let's start with a word of prayer. But dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, that we could be in your house and worship you. We pray, Lord, your spirit would be here and move in mighty ways. Take care of your people. So be with us. Be with Jean and Norman as they grieve, lost their sister. We also pray for Nancy and her difficulties that you would watch over her and get her back up and around very, very soon. We love you, Lord. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Charlie. Well, if I first song didn't get your... Get your uh... Blood pump? Maybe this will. Hey, let's all stand and sing. I'll fall away. <laughs>
Something that always concerns me in my personal life is that I get to the place sometimes of where things become habit. We brush our teeth regularly. We don't think about it. We do a lot of things in our life that are just nothing more than habit. And I really don't ever want the Lord's Supper to be a habit. I want it to be routine. I want it to be something I expect. I want it to be something I look forward to every time we come here together. I want it to be just that because there's an importance in this table. The importance is for us to remember that Jesus gave his life. He was crucified. He was buried. He was placed in a grave. And then he arose. He came from that grave. The purpose of his coming from the grave is this, that you and I and all who believe in him will be saved and have life eternal in heaven. That makes chills go up my neck to think what heaven might be like, that forever and ever and ever I can live with the creator of the universe. What a wonderful thing. Can you see how God loved you and I? He loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. That we could have life everlasting. Not just me, not just you, but anyone who, who calls upon the name of the Lord and gives himself to him in repentance and baptism can have this gift of life eternal forever and ever and ever. Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, <coughs> took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you take from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we cannot fully understand why the creator of the universe, the God, the only God, would give his son for mankind's sins. For Father, we know you did. And we know that he came and he was here on earth and that he lived and he taught and he died and he rose again. And now he's with you, Father. And that's where we want to be. So Father, as we come around this table, we remember you and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave for each of us. And it's because of that sacrifice that we give you thanks. 
In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>
show with great for the offering. Heavenly Father, we know that each of us here today have many things to be thankful for. That each of us have many blessings. Blessings that often we can't even count. So Father, we just pray that in our lives as Christian men and women, that we will be good stewards of what you've given us. And that we would, Father, always be willing to share that which we have with the needs of others. And at this time, Lord, as we bring this offering to you for this congregation, we just pray, <coughs> Lord, Father, that it might be used in a way that would honor you and that would bring souls to you. And that most of all, that whatever is done with these monies, you will be pleased with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the clean time of the day, we'll have to go to the funeral for David up, and I meant to mention that, just about forget it. <coughs> yes. Surgeries, 
those that have lost loved ones this week, we ask you to be with those families and help us to undergird them with your love. We just ask you to be with us as we are in this place to shed a light in this community throughout the world. We pray as prayer, prayer for especially for Tom today as he breaks it to us in the line. If there is one amongst us today that needs to make a decision, this will be the hour for you. Be God directs us and we ask you to forgive us when we fail you in Christ. We pray. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, David. Ron. Ron. Hey, uh, company. Is uh, Larry a good cook? Uh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I figured. Yeah, we're glad you're back. Hey, uh, Brianna asked me to make an announcement before I forget that the uh, study on five love languages is starting tonight at 6 30, and it's not too late to come and join. Right, Bree? Okay. So, that being said, let's stand and greet each other warmly. <laughs> friends, really good friends. 
One night during this basketball outing, one of the boys was making a sort of funny motion when he shot. It wasn't anything serious. But these two other guys started making fun of him for how he was shooting. We'll call those two boys the offenders. And then the one that was being made fun of, the offended. Well, it hurt the offended one so bad. It wasn't that big a deal. But it hurt him so bad that he refused to speak to the two offenders from that point on. And it went on for a long time. The two offenders felt bad and they went and apologized as much as they could. But the offended one would not forgive them. Went on for weeks and weeks. Weeks turned into months. And five months later, it finally ended. Because one of the offenders was killed in a motorcycle accident. And so the other offender went and told the offended one what had happened. And I could tell you from personal experience, because I was one of the offenders, and I went to the one that we'd made fun of and told him that our other buddy was dying and did die. And I'll never forget the look on his face that the chance for reconciliation was gone. Never again would he be able to restore that relationship because he held a grudge over something so silly. And from that moment on, for the rest of his life, he would not be able to accept forgiveness from this guy. That's what we're talking about today, is hopeful release. To forgive, the, the release of poison and, and angst and hatred in somebody's heart that they sometimes carry around for a lifetime. And it's not supposed to be that way. To forgive or not to forgive. You know, today we're in a fifth of a message on hope. You know, and this hope for release is to let go of that bitterness. Because you don't want to live like that. Nobody does. And, and not only that, but the Bible has some pretty strong words. Very strong words about forgiveness. In fact, forgiveness really is at the heart of of, of who we are as Christians. It's, it's at the very basic nature of what we are. We have been forgiven. If, if forgiveness wasn't in the picture, we wouldn't be meeting here today. We have been bought and paid for by Jesus' own blood and have been forgiven if we accept that gift because of what God has done for us. But I'm telling you, and, and I know as well as you do, this forgiveness can be a tough, tough thing. I understand so before we get into the scripture text today, let's look at some reasons people give for not forgiving. Okay? And some of them sound pretty good. But really, are they? The first reason people don't forgive is a, a sense of power. You know, sometimes people don't forgive because they can kind of hold it over to the offender. The offender. I think that's what our buddy did. You know, he said, I, he held power. I'm not going to speak to you anymore. I have power over you. You're going to come crawling someday. It's, it's that sense of power. It, it seems like they now have control over a situation that they never had control over before. And they don't want to give that up. To forgive someone they think would be justifying the terrible thing that that person did. Like it never happened. But this is not what forgiveness is all about. It's not that at all. And some people say forgive and forget. And that's not possible either. You know, we're not computers. We don't have a delete button. You know, boink, it's gone. It's hard. Forgiveness has to go deeper than that. It doesn't work that way. You know, you can forgive someone, and I can forgive someone, but that doesn't mean you have to trust them anymore or give them responsibility somewhere that they're not, you know, able to do. That's not what forgiveness is either. Forgiveness is giving up our right to get even or to be paid back. Forgiveness is more for the one offended than for the offender. The offender may not even care that you're holding in a grudge. So what? They might say, I don't care. Good for you. Hope it makes you miserable. Forgiving is for the benefit of the one that's hurt. Holding in resentment and having an unforgiving spirit is harmful. It is. It's poison. 
Here's some famous quotes from some famous people that sort of goes along with that. C.S. Lewis, famous Christian writer, said this, We all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. It's hard. Lewis Speed said to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner was you. And then there's another quote that's attributed to lots of people. I like this one. Resentment is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Forgiveness, held, lack of forgiveness and this resentment held in is deadly and it's unscriptural. Another reason people don't forgive, and this is really deep theologically, I came up with this myself, they just don't want to. Don't want to. You know, they hurt me back. They hurt me bad, and I'm never going to let that happen again. I don't like them. I don't want them around me, and I'm not going to forgive them for what they did to me. You know, I understand. I understand that. Some things are easier to forgive than others, aren't they? You cut me off in traffic, you know, yeah, I can forgive you for that. Not much trouble. Humiliate me? Yeah, I could probably might be a little bit harder, but I, I'll forgive you. You know, lie about me? It's harder still, but it's doable. <clears throat> Abuse my wife or kids or grandchildren? I'm going to need some help with that. I'm going to need some help. Some don't forgive because they're waiting for the offender to act. After all, they're the ones that did the bad thing. They should make the first move. You know, and sometimes it happens, but a lot of times that's never going to happen. What are you going to do then? Some people don't forgive because the pain is just too deep. Some don't forgive because they don't deserve my forgiveness, they say. If I forgive, like we said, it's like saying it's okay. It never happened. And I'm not going to do that. You know, this, this is really where being a Christian gets tough. You know, whoever said Christianity was an easy life, they're, they're wrong. This is tough stuff. This is where we live. There are things we don't want to do, but there are things that we're called to do, whether we feel like it or not. And we are commanded to forgive by Jesus himself. In Matthew 6, he says, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's pretty serious stuff. And Jesus told a parable in the book of Matthew about an unforgiving servant. You, you remember, remember this servant owed like the king like a million dollars. And he couldn't pay it. They were throwing him in jail. But he went and begged for forgiveness for this debt. The king felt sorry for him. Yes, I forgive you. But then that same servant, remember, went out and had a buddy that owed him 10 bucks or something. And he beat him and he said, throw him in prison. And the other servants went to the king and told him what had happened. And the, and the parable ends like this. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now, I'm really getting serious. Not only we have to forgive, we have to forgive from the heart. There it is again, over and over in Scripture, it's the heart. And it's a matter of the heart. That's where it is. Over and over, Jesus tells us it's your heart. It's your heart. That's what comes out of the heart. You know, but our hearts aren't very good a lot of times. Our hearts aren't good enough. And to forgive some things that have been so painful to us, we're going to have to have the heart of Christ in us. Because we can't do it on our own. I guarantee it. But we, we who call ourselves Christians, we're set apart. We're not like the world. Our citizenship is in heaven. <coughs> we are told not to hold grudges and to harbor unforgiveness. We may not want to forgive, but we're called to forgive. And with the help of the Lord, we can do it. You know, Paul gives a great description of how we are to live in this world. This is our scripture for today, Colossians 3. Listen to the description of how we are supposed to live. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive. 
whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wow. We are called to such a higher standard in the world. We're to be kind and gentle and compassionate. Our actions and attitudes are a reflection of our witness for Christ, are they not? What are people seeing in us? What are people seeing in us? A bitter, unforgiving person with a scowl on her face. I'm going to get that person. I'm going to get even. Who would be drawn to that? Or are they seeing a loving and forgiving person? And, and to forgive as the Lord forgave us? Now how high a calling is that? The Lord paid for our sin debt himself. It cost him a lot. And in turn, we're to forgive like that. Easy said, but how? How do we do it? Well, I think there's a lot of ways. I'll, I'll mention a couple today. First of all, I think we need to tell God of the struggle we're having. You know, if we try to forgive on our own, we'll probably fall short. If this was something really, really grievous against us. We need to ask God for help. Tell him that you're having a hard time forgiving someone. Psalms 12 says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord wants to help us. He wants to help us do the things he commanded us to do. God will not force you to forgive, but he will help you do it. The second thing is, make a list of the times you were forgiven. And I thought, you know, if we did that, it'd be a long list. We've all messed up, haven't we? Anybody here not messed up? Didn't think so. We've all sinned. There's times we have been forgiven just by other people. Maybe there was a debt you owed and, and somebody forgave that debt. Or maybe you were irresponsible and did something and somebody else had to clean up the mess. Maybe you just got a warning from that cop that time you were pulled over for speeding. You were forgiven and paying a fine. You know, if you really want to make a list of things to start with, you know, start with the sins we have committed against God. Things we've done, things we've said, things we've thought of, things we wished we could do, times we should have done something and we didn't, times you went along with the crowd and you shouldn't have and you gave no thought to what Jesus would have you do. We could spend all day, all week, all month, all of us here making a list of the times we have been forgiven for that stuff. 1 John 1, I love this scripture. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. The last one, and this is the toughest one, if you want to really forgive someone, begin to pray for the offender. Now you, some people, whoa, wait a minute there, Tommy boy. <laughs> I mean, I'm with you so far, but pray for that person? What? Are you kidding me? That's too far. I can't do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It may not be what you want to do. It may not be that you can't do it. It may be that you won't do it. But remember your witness. If you're a Christian and how people are looking at you. And how the Lord has forgiven you. And remember that forgiving is more for your benefit. Than for the offender. Here's the words of Jesus himself in Luke 6. But I tell you who hear me. Love your enemies. Do good. To those that hate you. 
Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Remember how I told you Christianity can be tough? It is sometimes. But I know this works. I know this works. You know, I started this message with a story of how I was one of the offenders. Years and years ago, when I was a younger man, I was offended. I was offended, and it hurt me deeply. I'm not going to tell the whole story about it, but, you know, and it doesn't involve anybody here. It was a long time ago. But somebody did something to me, and I wanted to get back. You ever felt that way? Come on now. Just not me, right? It was a guy. He did something to me that affected my family. And I wanted to go and bust him up. I did. Say, golly, Tom, I didn't think you could be like that. The poison in me was hard to deal with. I didn't like it. I didn't like the way it made me feel. So one, a counselor or somebody I read somewhere said, you know, start to pray for the offender. And maybe I was like, maybe you're how you're feeling. So, man, I don't think I'd do that. I don't like this guy. I want him hurt. I don't want him blessed. But I was a man of God. And I didn't want to feel that way. So I did. I started praying. Started praying for this guy. And at first, I didn't really mean it. I mean, I, I said the words, you know, but I, you know, but I kept doing it. I kept doing it. Every day. Hope this guy be all right. You know, bless him. And you know what happened after a few weeks or a month or so? I started to mean it. I did. And, and I could feel the poison leaving my soul. And I could feel the peace of God taking its place. And you know why? Because the Lord wants us to forgive. And he'll help us do it. But he won't make us. I'm, I'm encouraging you right now. If, if there's somebody that you're holding a grudge against, start praying for them. You know, they may never change. Maybe they'll never be sorry. Maybe nothing with their life will ever happen. But I guarantee you, it will change you. It will. You remember what Jesus told those guys? Remember that woman was caught in adultery and they were going to stone her to death? And, and you know, he, he says this great thing, John 8 says, When they kept on questioning, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin... Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So I have this recommendation for you. If you still want to withhold forgiveness against someone, just make sure that you have never sinned. Now, if you can say you've never sinned, then go ahead and throw those stones. But we all know that all of us have sinned. None of the guys that day threw a stone at that woman because they knew they had sinned. And none of us should be throwing stones either. I want to close with this powerful story of forgiveness. I read this from a guy, Derek Tucker, who writes this. But it's a famous story. It might be familiar to you. But I don't think there's any better example of forgiveness than this story I'm going to read you. It's about Corey Ten Boom. You remember Corey Ten Boom? Corey Ten Boom was imprisoned by the Nazis during World War II. Because her family provided a hiding place for Jews when they were being arrested. She and her sister Betsy were sent to Ravensbrook, where horrible torture, rape, and death occurred on a regular basis. Betsy died in the prison camp, but Corey miraculously survived. She became an effective Christian author and speaker. In 1947, she was invited to speak in Munich, Germany. That evening, she spoke on the topic of forgiveness. How God buries our sin in the depths of the sea. 
After her talk, she was approached by a man who looked familiar to her. With horror, she recognized him as one of the cruelest guards at the concentration camp. She remembered the shame of walking naked in front of this very man. Suddenly, all the fear and hatred returned in a flash. He said to her, in your talk, you mentioned Ravensbrook. I was a guard there. But since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from you as well. He held out his hand to Corey and said, will you forgive me? Corey wrote about that encounter. She said, it could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. I stood there with coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me. I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. Then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Wow. You know, I, I know, like I said before, <clears throat> there's people that have hurt you deeply. I get that. I get it. The best thing you can do is to forgive them, whether they ask for it or not. Do it for yourself and for your witness for Christ. Now, look, if you leave here today thinking, you know, I'm really having a hard time with this. I must not be a very good Christian. No. That's Satan putting that in your mind, too. You, you start somewhere, and you work up slowly. You start to pray. You start to watch the poison. Just like Corey stuck out her hand. That was an act of her will, and God supplied what she needed. Start praying for that person or persons today. And see what God has done. And what he will do to let you be released from the prison of resentment and hatred in your heart. Maybe there's no one in here struggling with that. That's great. But you probably know someone that is. Share this with them. And let Christ be honored and glorified in our actions. Let's pray. Dear Lord, this is tough. Man, this is tough, Lord. But you've never asked us to do anything that you haven't done yourself and that you will not help us with. Jesus, you were on that cross being tortured to death when you asked your Father to forgive them that were doing that to you. Help us, Lord, to forgive those that have hurt us. Help us to be great witnesses for you and people can see the love of Christ in us when we forgive. We need help with this, Lord. Sometimes it's really tough. There's some horrible things that have been done to people right here in this room or listening right now. Help us. Help us let go of the bitterness. If there's someone here today, Lord, that needs prayer or to accept you as Savior for the first time. They have never done that. You know, they're having a rough time with this because they don't have you with them to help them. Let this be the day they come and give their life to you with faith and repentance to be baptized into you and to walk a new life full of the Holy Spirit that will give them power to be victorious over everything, even resentment. We love you, Lord. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. If you have a need today, let me give it to the Lord.
women's meeting tomorrow at 1 o'clock and other things. And next Sunday, gentlemen, we're having our men's prayer breakfast. And so hope you come for that. Hey, Johnny, would you close us today? Father, you know, we've got to close, Lord, another beautiful second of all. That all things, God, like today, has come to me. But I thank you for all the people, Lord, who came here today, the brothers and sisters. And Lord, I pray our praises have been loud and have been great. And Lord, you're satisfied with what we've done. I thank you, Lord, for grace and every part of this service. So we do prayer, Lord, and we'll give you the song to be lifted up to you. And God, it makes us think what's said in Revelation this morning, Lord, as we step the book of the heart and the beautiful things and the praise and the worship. So God, take our worship today, Lord, as a blessing to you. And take our love, Lord, and the very thing that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for the resurrection and we can have eternal life with you. Go with us, Father, keep us safe. Bring us back to the holy path. In Jesus' name, I humbly pray. Amen.